All right, everyone. Welcome, welcome. Thank you so much for joining us for the fourth and final session of this cycle of youth advocacy training. It has been a really awesome session so far. We're really grateful for all of our participants um, who have been super engaged and asking really wonderful questions and um, just sticking with us as we uh, went through that open community discussion kind of midway through the program. Um, we really appreciate you guys' flexibility and enthusiasm for the program. Um, and we hope that you're excited for this this last session. Um, so as always, as we are waiting for things to kick off here for a minute, you can go ahead and introduce yourselves in the chat. Today's icebreaker is what does community mean to you? We've talked a lot about community over the last couple of sessions, and we know in general that community can look like a lot of things. It can look like your sports groups, your school clubs, your friend group, your family your religious affiliation, your other extracurricular activities. Um, but what does it actually mean to you uh, as, as an individual who is a part of multiple communities? You can honestly have a lot of definitions for what that means to you personally. So um, take a minute, introduce yourselves in the chat, and then we will get started. All right, uh, we have community is a group of people living together and working together. I could definitely see that for sure. Uh, somebody else said community means shared problems and finding solutions together, definitely. Somebody else said, uh, one of our Youth Advisory Council members, Thomas from Brazil, said community means belonging and inclusion and something that can start as a group but is always open to new members and new ideas. I love that, I definitely definitely agree. Um, awesome. Well, keep that coming in the chat. And as always, if you have any questions throughout the session, feel free to use the chat feature and the Q&A feature. Um, but first things first, let's make sure if you missed a session, be sure to check out the recordings for all of the previous sessions on the World Ocean Day YouTube channel. You guys should be familiar with that by now. Um, and then for today's agenda, it's basically the exact same, except we will have a little bit of extra time to talk about your post uh, pro program surveys for the certificate of completion. Um, now, uh, to get us started off, uh, I'm going to introduce our wonderful session speaker for today. We have Miguela Marzolf, uh, the, oh, that is not your title, my apologies, the Ocean Policy Coordinator for the Seattle Aquarium. She's got a ton of really awesome experience in a lot of different areas regarding organizing and environmental policy. So, um, Miguela, welcome, and um, I'll let you introduce yourself a little bit. Yeah. Uh, thanks so much, Laura. Hi, everyone. My name is Miguela Marzoff. I use she, her pronouns, and um, I am the Ocean Policy Coordinator for the Seattle Aquarium. Um, I have been in this role for a little over a year now, which it does not feel like it has been that long. Uh, it's gone by very quickly. Um, my background is primarily in communications and, um, outreach and engagement. <clears throat> and so I use a lot of those skills in my current role, and I'm happy to be here with you all today to, um, talk about environmental policy and advocacy and answer any questions that you might have. Awesome. Yeah. So uh, we're really excited to have you. And again, really appreciate you joining us in your busy schedule on a Saturday for this conversation. So starting things off, campaign organizing can encompass a lot. Um, and driving these changes that we're all kind of looking for requires a lot of teamwork and a lot of patience. So the fundamental question here is kind of where do we begin? What is the start 
of building collective action, building power. Um, so the first question here is why slash how does building collective power through campaigning contribute to more substantial achievements for the broader movement such as ocean and climate action? When I read this question in preparing for today, I was like, oh my gosh, I don't know if I can answer that in a reasonable amount of time. So I'm gonna do my best to be succinct um, and still provide an answer. Um, so I guess I'll start with the why first. So why does building collective power um, contribute to more substantial achievements? Um, I think we've seen some really great examples in the last few years of what collective power and what collective grassroots organizing can do, right? Um, in 2020, as an example, you know, Stacey Abrams was leading a big, big campaign to get people in Georgia, primarily um, Black people in Georgia, signed up and ready to vote and making sure that they understood what barriers might exist for them and how they could um, you know, surpass those barriers. And I think it's just really important to, to remember, like we are all human beings and being vulnerable is always difficult. And especially in instances where we're, we're talking about really important um, topics like climate change or climate action or, um, you know, inclusion and equity, we, you know, it can be really hard to be vulnerable all alone. So if we do that collectively, we kind of lend each other our strengths and we are complementing each other. And also it doesn't feel as scary to be so vulnerable or to be taking such action when you're part of a larger group or a larger movement, I guess. Um, and I guess that's part of the how as well. So depending on the um, the action that you're working on or the topic that you're working on, you know, how you start will kind of vary. So for example, if you're, if we're thinking about climate action, that might look different in Seattle than it does in Kingston, Jamaica, for example, um, as I see someone is from, or it might look different in Portugal. So I think, um, you know, we have to think about our community as kind of like concentric circles, right? Like there's a smaller one inside a bigger one, inside of another bigger one, inside of, right? We're not just part of one community. We're part of many communities. Um, so thinking about, okay, what, what is happening in my community? Is there already a group that's doing this work? What is my local government doing? Um, and then based on that, you know, if there's already a group that exists, join them. I will tell you right now, all of these groups will always, always, always be thrilled to have youth joining them in whatever action that they're planning. Um, and then, you know, if there's not one, talk to your peers, maybe talk to other students who care about the things that you care about, or, um, you know, maybe you're already friends with a lot of people who are just as passionate, like build some ideas, create your own community. Um, because you, youth messaging and youth voices are, is incredibly powerful. Yeah, absolutely. Miguel, I, I really appreciate that. I, I also really, really appreciate you talking about being vulnerable and, and you know, trying to find community through that. I think that's really important and, and definitely something we've also talked about throughout this program as well. Um, and I think you also kind of dove into a little bit the second question here already, which is what are the most critical steps that young advocates can take together in order to achieve that collect collective action, talking about, you know, whatever it is, the issues that you care about are and, and you know, who is in your community reaching out to them and, and talking about these issues that mean something to you that you want to take action on and, and bringing those members of your community in on this. So, what does a campaign actually look like? Like, what does it mean to build a campaign that is a very broad term and can mean a lot of things? So let's kind of like dissect that a little bit. Sorry, my dog has decided to, we have a really bad windstorm here in Washington. And so the branch is hitting the window and he's losing his mind. So give me a second. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> I appreciate you guys uh, adding to the chat as well um, what community means to you, sharing the same values and same goals, uh, understanding community as a group, sharing common experience and values. Yeah, a lot of the stuff that we're talking about. So I'll, I'll pass it off to you again. Yeah, sorry about that. Um, so I think similar, I think, I think a lot of my answers are gonna be, well, it depends. And I'm sorry, that's, I'm not trying to use that as a cop out. But it does depend, right? Like it depends on the culture that you're a part of. Like 
perhaps, you know, um, the way, not perhaps, but the way that we communicate also really depends on the community that we're a part of, right? So um, when we're thinking about the campaign, I think firstly, what it means is in my, in my view is creating awareness, at least at the very least, that's what your, your kind of goal is. Right. And you might have other goals on top of that, where you want legislators to vote yes on a particular bill or piece of legislation, or you want people to show up at an event, but at the very least you are spreading awareness about those things. So I think just keeping that in mind is really helpful. <clears throat> and Typically, when I think of campaigns, um, I think about them as kind of almost like communications or marketing campaigns, right? Like when we're talking about climate change and issues as a part of climate change and action that we want people to take, we're communicating with them. We're telling them why cl climate change action is important or why climate action is important. We're explaining to them what climate change could mean for them and their communities. We're explaining to them actions that they can take to you know, help um, lower their carbon footprint. So all of those things are actually really, when you boil them, you know, get down to the, the nitty gritty is communication and outreach. So I, that's how I like to think of campaigns, although it might have, you know, additional layers. Um, so a lot of times you might see, I'm trying to think of a more global example, um, but like here in the US, for example, um, Right now, we in Washington State, we just had a uh, an election, of course, um, in the U.S. And one of the um, initiatives on our ballot was to repeal a our Climate Commitment Act, which is a huge piece of legislation that really supports climate action and habitat restoration and and a lot of other things. So that had its own campaign, and it had a full team as well as like over three hundred. Um, member organizations supporting it. And that was really about getting out the word to voters, making sure that voters understood what that initiative really meant, why it wouldn't benefit them, why it would be harmful for them to um, vote yes on that, why it's important for them to understand what that, what the Climate Commitment Act actually does. And, um, you know, we used social media, we use like um, canvassing, phone banking, um, setting up at farmers markets and other events where we could talk about this and why it, why it's so important. Um, so you there are a lot of tools in your toolbox, but I think overall the campaign is really, again, about finding that common ground and spreading awareness and, and um, communicating with people. Yeah, definitely. And I, I do think that that is a good example, even though that is more specific to the United <laughs> States. I, I still think it is applicable because the main idea is that the people in charge have this idea. And given the goals that we have commonly amongst all of us in this movement, that idea kind of goes against those goals. So how do we organize our community Absolutely. around mm -hmm. this one idea? And like you said, any campaign at the very base is just spreading of information and, and trying to get out an idea. So I definitely think that that is still super applicable to all of this for sure. Um, now we've talked about what the baseline of a campaign is, and we've talked about, you know, the goals of a campaign, but how do we actually make sure that the goals of the campaign are consistent, are unified, and make sure that together it actually creates effective uh, campaigns? So with working together with different people, you're obviously going to get a lot of different opinions. You're going to get a lot of different insights and different backgrounds from whoever it is that you're working with. Um, but all in all, in general, if, if a group of people are working together on a campaign, generally speaking, their ideas are s roughly similar. Um, but there's always going to be a little bit of, of disagreement or, you know, slight argument, uh, not necessarily in the negative sense, but in a positive way um, about the goals of the campaign. So with young leaders specifically, how can they ensure that their personal motivations, if they are participating in, in helping organize a campaign or if they're leading a campaign themselves, how do they make sure that their po personal motivations align with the broader goals of the campaign? Yeah, Laura's um, giving me all the tricky questions on a Saturday. <laughs> <I'm sorry. laughs> um, 
This is really one that I struggle to answer because I think here in the United States, at the at least, um, conflict is something that we are very, very avoidant of. We don't like contact. We don't like to work. Um, you know, we, we get very territorial almost. Um, and, and sometimes it can be really difficult um, to find common ground or, you know, sometimes it can be really discouraging. You feel like, well, we have nothing in common. Like, how are we ever going to make a difference? Um, so I totally understand from a U.S. perspective how this could feel really daunting. For other um, cultures and countries, perhaps this might also be a problem or might feel like a problem, but perhaps not. So I think one of the first um, things we can do, uh, you know, when we're looking for organizations or movements that align with our personal goals is to be really upfront with ourselves about what those goals are and be really upfront with what are you willing to compromise on? Because inevitably you will have to compromise something, not necessarily today or tomorrow or even six months from now, but eventually, you know, things will change, things evolve. And maybe you learn something new that changes your mind on a particular policy or on an approach and how you want to address um, that thing. So I think being really ref self-reflective is really helpful. Um, and then, you know, you start looking at, okay, what is, Again, what, who's out there and what are they doing? And what, you know, what aligns with my personal values? So a lot of times organizations or movements will have websites or Instagram accounts or even TikTok accounts that you can go and see, like, what are they posting about? What, you know, who, what are they asking folks to do? How, are, how do they want people to engage? Um, and that can tell you a lot about the work that they're doing and their you know, how they're messaging things. And if it resonates with you, that's great. And, you know, that's a great place to start. When you're building your kind of your own movement or your own maybe coalition or your own organization, um, again, I think you think about, okay, what am I okay changing my mind about? Or what, am, what are the things that I'm not willing to change? And then, you know, as you bring people on board and you hear new ideas and you hear fresh ideas and maybe different perspectives, being open-minded is really, really valuable because someone else's experience might not be your own, but it might give you an advantage. Um, so for example, if someone else speaks a language that you don't speak, that's a brand new community that you're able to reach out to, right? Um, if someone is from a cultural background where you don't really know a lot of about that um, group and you you know you're not really sure and you you know that there could be some mistrust then having someone who's from that culture or that um, community can be really insightful um and then you know again I'm I apologize for using you know us examples but um you know in the us we have a two-party system and it can feel really daunting to find compromise. But I think what people often lose sight of is that we are all human. We all want to be healthy individuals. That gives us something to start with. Um, and, you know, in other countries, I think, you know, other countries typically have a lot more parties and are more often working as part of coalitions um, across, you know, two, three, four or more. So, you know, taking those same principles and thinking about, okay, what do we have in common? what might we be able to compromise on or what might we be able to get their support on um and really being clear about you know what your end goals are again what you're willing to compromise on and if you reach a point where you you know you say this has evolved into something i can't support um then take a step back reevaluate have you got learned new information that might that should maybe change your mind if not that's okay. We can change our minds or we can sometimes not change our minds. And it's okay to step away when it's just not the right fit. And it's okay to change your mind, even if you feel like, well, I used to believe this or that, and people are going to judge me for changing my, your mind, my mind. And we have to remember that's not true, right? We're human beings. We evolve, we change our minds. And that's, that's ultimately the end goal is to continue being open-minded and continue to work being together and continue that, you know, um, spirit of collaboration. Definitely. I think this, your response is super, super valuable. And I really appreciate it because 
you know, the, the, what are you willing to compromise on? I think having that list of non-negotiables for you personally is huge, huge in terms of what you are able to contribute, um, to the campaign because the, your list of non-negotiables is going to be different from somebody else's, but there's also going mm -hmm. to probably be a lot of overlap. So the places where Absolutely. it overlaps is definitely where like the broader campaign goals, you're going to be able to find stuff in there, but then also your, your ability to adapt and, and reflect is also hugely important. You know, we talked a lot about climate science throughout already this conversation and, and the program in general, if we're trying to do education, we're talking a lot about science and the scientific method at its core is, you know, our ability to reflect on new data and learn from new information. So I think your point about, you know, making sure that you're still doing that self-reflection and, and always constantly assessing where you are mentally in this space, where the goals of the campaign are headed. Um, I think that's really, really important as well. And to finish off this section in all of these discussions that you're going to have while participating in or, or leading a campaign or coalition or event or, or what have you, um, I think particularly Gen Z has this sort of innate sense of inclusion. So I don't think mm -hmm. that you know, we need to talk about why it's so important to have diversity in this particular conversation, because I think we're all very much on the same page about that. But in terms of like the tangible steps that it takes to make sure that everybody's voices are being heard in an equal and equitable way, what does that actually look like um, in terms of like actual, yeah, like tangible steps? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I know I'm hitting you with all the big ones today. I know, <laughs> uh, that's okay. Um, it's a really important question. And I'll be honest and say that I am not the expert on this. I don't know that there really is any one expert. Um, but I think when we're thinking about, okay, what steps can I take to ensure I have a safe, equitable, inclusive, et cetera, space? <clears throat> is to think about who is represented and already and who isn't. And that can be like, almost feel kind of awkward because you're like, it almost feels like you're checking the boxes on who's there and who's not there. And that's not what we wanna do. We don't wanna just check off boxes, but we wanna be really thorough and analytical about who we've invited to into our spaces, who's actually showing up and who's not. And if, for example, you are, um, you know, you recognize that you don't really have a lot of youth in this space, like you're the only one, speak up. Again, I will just like hammer home that officials elected or appointed doesn't matter. They want to hear from youth. They care a lot about what youth have to say. Um, and so they are more likely to listen to you um, if you make that kind of a priority. If you're thinking about constantly how you can use your position, whether um, you know in a group already or um, especially to bring others to the table. So I think being really um, analytical about how and or excuse me who's showing up um, is really kind of the critical first piece. Um, I also think that it's really important to be thinking about who typically is at the table. So when we're thinking about the, you know, conservation movement um, and, you know, climate change action and climate resilience and all of these pieces, when we're thinking about that from a ma mainstream perspective, it's historically very um, global north led, very white led, um, and typically sees, you know, is implementing conservation in a way that really separates humans from nature. But um, that's not how everyone feels, right? When we think about indigenous people, they are very much part of nature. They see themselves as a part of that system. Um, the way that they approach conservation is very different. And that's true for a lot of indigenous peoples from all over the world. And I just use that example um, as a way to be thinking about who is going to be impacted by climate change or by climate impacts, who helps, you know, kind of steward um, our lands and our waters and who's been involved in the past, let's say a hundred years and who's 
historically been left out. And that um, includes indigenous peoples, but it also includes people of the global South. So we really need to be thinking about what we can do, all of us collectively and individually to help amplify other voices. And we all have different ways that we can do that. Um, maybe it's social media. Like maybe you have a social media account that has 5,000 followers. You can use that. That can be your platform to be thinking about how you can create safe, equitable, inclusive, youth-centered spaces because you're, again, going back to the campaign, you are essentially creating a campaign in which you are educating others. You're sharing perhaps your experience with others. You're sharing ways that they can help, et cetera. Um, other ways you can think about that is, you know, when you are creating your organization or your club or, you know, whatever space that might be for you, how might you connect with someone that you haven't really connected with before? Um, and, you know, as we continue to include others and those of us who, um, you know, come from more privileged backgrounds do that work, it will become easier and easier as we go along. And, you know, as Laura, you mentioned, you know, Gen Z kind of seems to have this innate um, sense of what's right when it comes to, um, you know, diversity, equity, inclusion, justice, accessibility, all of these things that we're thinking about. Um, as you all, you know, take up space in these areas where more traditionally conservative older folks are, you will continue to push us forward, right? If you think about where you all are in your lives, let's say, I'm not sure how old everyone is and you don't have to tell me, but you know, let's say you're 18, you've got 40 to 50 years, hopefully, um, of being able to do this work. And the more you do it now, the easier it will get and the more awareness you will spread and the more likely it will be that others start doing the same thing and we're creating this kind of rippled effect. So I don't want to make it seem like it's easy. It's not. Um, it can be really heartbreaking sometimes. It can be really difficult sometimes. Sometimes it can feel like you've done or said the wrong thing or you second guess yourself because you don't want to do those things. Um, and what I like to remind myself is that it is about progress, not perfection. It is about being accountable for our, our actions and learning along the way we are all going to make mistakes. We're not always going to get it right, but being open to feedback, being open to self-reflection, being open to changing our minds as we get new information. Like Laura said, that's a key part of the scientific method. It's also just a key part of life in my experience. And I think all of those things will help all of you um, create those spaces. And I guess I'll just end with, you know, if you, I, I'm seeing in the chat a little bit of like youth are often excluded from these conversations or um, maybe don't feel like they have as much weight in decision making. I totally understand that. It is, you know, not easy um, to be, maybe you can't vote yet, or maybe you just like don't feel like you quite know how to influence policy. Again, I would just remind you all, like use your, use your communities. Um, you know, whether that's, again, your church or your school or maybe an extracurricular cl club you're a part of, those all have positions that you could use to make a difference that you could use to start influencing. And it's okay to start small and then build that momentum. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think that was a very well-rounded response to these admittedly quite <laughs> heavy questions. And I think to your point, I think that that transparency of, you know, we're not always going to get it right. Nobody always has a hundred percent of the correct answers a hundred percent of the time. I think that is, is a really huge part of, of all of this, but especially in terms of making sure that everybody is, is feeling heard and, and valued within the space. Um, so another part of, of what you had just mentioned in, in talking about particularly, you know, connecting with indigenous leaders who have that, uh, traditional knowledge of certain areas that they inhabit, um, the strongest campaigns are rooted in genuine connections with the communities that they support. Mm -hmm. So how do we actually foster those genuine connections? You know, um, the main question here is, and I, I feel like all three of these questions can kind of be lumped together in, in one, uh, yeah. how can campaign leaders ensure their campaign goals align with the needs of the community that they aim to serve? We just talked about how individuals, uh, individual goals align with the broader campaign goals. Now it's how do the campaign goals align with the community goals? And then 
as you go through that process of trying to figure out how to make sure that they are aligned, how do you actually go about communicating with the members of your community that you're trying to support? And, and um, you know, there's, we, again, both have talked a lot about Gen Z and, and that intergenerational collaboration you mentioned, moving forward and, and pushing the more traditionally conservative, older folks in a more progressive direction we still will need as young people some help mm -hmm. from the older generations who have that um learned knowledge and that experience so how can we actually maintain that without being like oh no like we're young people we know exactly what we need to do versus the people who have actually experienced a lot more life okay. <laughs> um so yeah i guess all of these can mm -hmm. kind of be answered as as one yeah okay uh where to start let's see so I think about the, the last question um, and how we can think about who's missing and who, you know, is kind of present um, and going back to like, how do we identify groups that align with our values? Um, I'd say those things also play a role here. So oftentimes groups, particularly in the context of climate change, groups or communities that are most impacted by climate change or, um, you know, pollution, sea level rise, whatever, whatever it is that we're talking about. Um, when it comes to environmental justice, <clears throat> a lot of groups that have, have been experienced injustice in their communities are already organizing or doing something. Often that is the case. Um, they're typically, if they're being impacted by something, they typically have a view on how it should be remedied, what they need to do that, what resources they don't are lacking, what resources do they have? So I would say first and foremost, it's identifying like who is who are leaders in that community, perhaps. Um, and that can be tricky. Um, depending on the community, it could be a religious or spiritual leader. It could be um, a member of like city council or some other council group. It could be a grassroots organization that's already in existence. So it might take a little bit of time to identify exactly who it is. But um, again, I think Google is really helpful, but I also will encourage you to keep using social media. It's not perfect. There are, of course, lots of qualms with social media and it gets a bad rep, but it is a really great way to understand, you know, what people are doing in their communities, what messaging they're already pushing out there. And the reason that I say it's really important to take at least first a survey of what that community might already be doing is because there probably is already a mistrust. A lot of these communities are very insular. And what I mean by that is that, you know, if we're thinking about, again, for as an example, um, a community that has historically lived in a really polluted area for more than one generation for three, four generations. And that pollution has impacted not only them, but you know their family members. If we come in as you know advocates and we take over and we say, well, we know that you need clean air and we're just gonna do that for you. That creates a lot of distrust and can actually undermine the work that you're trying to do. Um, because it kind of comes off like we're trying to be a savior for them and that's not what they're looking for. So really be thoughtful about what relationship that community has with leaders in your area, whether that's, you know, we're talking about at the city level, state, um, province, et cetera. And it's really important, again, for us to think about, okay, what might this community need? And that's where I think you all, as youth who are really passionate about this, can think about what can we help them do? Again, you guys are pretty great with technology. You know how technology works. You know how to use it to your advantage, whether that's social media or other technological um, tools. You probably have like a great um, network through like your friends and your clubs and maybe even from this, um, you know, uh, summit that you all have been doing over the last few weeks. So I think those kind of pieces are critical, right? surveying what's already being done by that community and then thinking about what you can bring to them. Um, 
that is really, really helpful and will also really help with building trust. And um, I think the next kind of key piece is being really transparent about the work that you're doing to support them, being really transparent about what your goals are, what you care about. And, you know, if they say like, we're not really looking for support, that's okay. You can still do your work, but you've been thoughtful about how you could support them. You've been thoughtful about trying to, you know, do outreach, trying to engage with them, trying to support them in these, in these really authentic ways. And once you've done that, I think it will be a little bit less daunting um, as you move forward. Um, and so again, like when it comes to how do you identify those folks, I know people are um, dropping in the chat. Yeah. Like religious leaders, um, maybe even like the school principal or um, headmaster, right? Like or teachers. Teachers are such an undervalued resource, at least here in the States. Um, but teachers have a, a good sense of what their students need and what students from different backgrounds are going through and what students from different areas are going through. Similarly, um, students like your peers, others, you know, who um, are passionate about these things. Um, and libraries. Libraries are great resources. And librarians are great resources. Um, librarians know a lot about what's happening in their community because they have to. They are, their job is to connect with that community to help, you know, encourage students who are struggling to read or to help encourage, you know, a single mom to spend some quality time with her kid or a single dad or, you know, whatever. Um, so there are lots of people in these communities that we might not think of, but I just encourage you to be like, think outside the box, you know, think about the institutions that are in these communities already and, and how you might connect with them. And, you know, I'm very confident that if you show up as a young person who's passionate and, you know, who just wants to help their community, people are going to get behind you and they're going to help you do some of that work. Um, yeah. Yeah, and, I'm just, no, go ahead. Sorry. <laughs> oh, no, that's okay. I was just going to really quickly touch. I realized that I didn't talk about like intergenerational collaboration. Um, that is something that I myself struggle with, you know, because it can also be really like overwhelming to try to get your, I don't know, like great grandfather to change his mind or like even your mom sometimes, whatever. Um, and I think it goes back to finding common ground. And I also think this might be like um, taboo or maybe like a little sticky for me to say, but I would also use your position as a youth, as youth to your advantage, AKA use guilt, right? Like older people only have X amount of time left in this world. Unfortunately, that's just the nature of, of um, life, you know, the life cycle, but you hopefully we'll have a long time before, you know, that happens. And, you know, like you need to remind them that you are the ones who will have to live with the consequences of their actions. And when you put a face to that, meaning like when you all are showing up to their offices, if they're legislators or, you know, whatever, um, and like putting your face to that message, that is really um i have to unmute myself to talk okay but, there you go You're you know okay. <laughs> using that um kind of guilt trip if you want or you know a really crude way to say it but putting your face to the future put you know really reminding them like they represent you all they represent the future, their decisions impact the future. And you, it can be really a great tool to um, creating that collaboration. Very much so. And I, I wrote down earlier in your response to these questions about being creative with how you're learning, like you mentioned social media, um, being creative, you mentioned something about thinking outside of the box. I think that's hugely, hugely important in terms of where you're looking to find new community connections and, and how you go about 
engaging with your community and learning about what's happening in your community. And I think to the point as well, thinking outside of the box, showing up authentically and, and coming to the table with your passion, your, your heart on your sleeve, as they say, and, and making sure that the people who you're engaging with know that you really do have these pure intentions. Um, and I also appreciate you talking about the, the difficulties that can come with intergenerational um, collaboration, it can be very difficult, but I will, I will share this short anecdote before we move to the next slide. My, my own grandmother, um, who I adore, she lives in Florida and has been there since the 70s, and there has been a lot in terms of environmental and social, political, economic conversations as far as Florida is concerned. Um, but she has always been a feminist. She's always cared a lot about the environment. And she is now 83 years old. And she actively has conversations with her peers about policy and how important it is to safeguard the future of the planet. And one of the things that she's talked to me a lot about is um how difficult those conversations can be with her own peers because they don't understand that you know their current priorities will have really negative impacts on their grandchildren in the future and she often talks to her peers about you know well don't you have grandkids don't you have grandchildren this is what you're setting them up for if you you know act in in certain ways or vote for certain things so yeah it it definitely can be kind of tricky but i think that finding the older folks who are actually actively wanting to listen to you and find people like you to listen to is hugely important. It's difficult, but they are out there. You just kind of have to, you know, again, think outside of the box in order to to find them. Um, I also think that, you know, asking teachers and librarians is a, is a huge part of that as well. Um, now, in terms of like the tangible, sorry, there's sirens, if you can hear it in the background. Um, in terms of the tangible policy side of things, the, the role that more policy-based advocacy plays in all of this, we've talked a lot about um, you know, education and outreach and all of this, but when it comes to the actual legislative side of advocacy, it really helps grassroots campaigns to actually be tied to real policy. Um, and that can be easily one of the most overwhelming parts of advocacy as a young person, because these grand institutions, you know, whatever you think about them, whatever you feel about how these institutions either came to be or how they exist in the modern day, whatever you think, these are still institutions that, again, we will have to, in a way, work with at some point if we want to have the largest scale impact that we possibly can. So for young people who are trying to connect their grassroots campaigns to those broader policy and legislative efforts, where do they go for that? How do they actually start that process? Yeah, this is a great question. And unfortunately, or fortunately, I'm not sure, <laughs> but I can only really speak to this in terms of um, a U.S. political system and similar um, political systems. <clears throat> um, so when we're thinking about policy-based advocacy, right, typically we've identified a problem, we want to address it, and then, you know, the next step is like, okay, how do we use existing policy. So or is there already something in existence um, that's being violated here? So for example, if we think about pollution and some factory is just like dumping all of their effluent into the river, there currently anyway is, you know, um, there are pieces of legislation that forbid that. And so in that case, um, you'd be looking more at like litigation, like suing, right? But there's a flip side of that where maybe there doesn't exist any sort of um, bill or law or regulation about a particular issue. Um, and so that is where we start thinking about, OK, how can we influence decision makers to fix this problem? So, again, I think getting FaceTime with your legislator or your representative or whatever you might call that person, but the person who represents you in 
like in parliament or the house or whatever it may be is really, really helpful. Also, I think it's really helpful to, again, look at what other organizations are doing. Um, like how have they come across these issues? How have they um, tried to find solutions for these issues, et cetera? And then when we're thinking about, okay, how do we tie the grassroots kind of campaigns that we've done to broader policy and legislative efforts? I think oftentimes it will kind of happen on its own. Um, you know, like, for example, if as my early example, when when I was talking about the campaign um, to repeal, you know, a big piece of environmental legislation here um, that is tied kind of automatically um, to that or flip that on its head where sometimes it starts with a policy and then you're doing, you know, the advocacy is kind of top down. So um Sometimes it will be really obvious and sometimes it won't. In those cases where you're starting out on a, an issue and there's not really a clear legislative um, end goal, um, I think, again, it's really being thoughtful and considering who you have, like who's in your you know, organization or your um, efforts and what strengths do they have? Because I guarantee someone will have some strength that relates to thinking about policy. So especially when we're thinking about intergenerationally um, or from multiple backgrounds, um, a lot of times those people know who their, who their representatives are, or they know how to write an op-ed to the newspaper um, or a letter to the editor. Um, those are great way, ways to start influencing policy. Um, Maybe you show up to a hearing about some other piece of policy, but that is related to what you also want to have happen. And then, you know, it's okay to ask for help. Like, it's totally fine to ask for help or say, like, this is what we really care about. Here's all the strengths that we have. Now we just kind of need help moving in the next direction. And again, librarians can help with that. Teachers can help with that professors could help with that, like at your local college or um, university. Um, even, even your parents, like, or other adults in your life who are passionate about this exact same issue or who, are, who you know have done similar work, um, you know, advocating for change or advocating. Um, and, you know, just again, like use your, we're young, but we care, like use that to your advantage. Use that to help you know, older people listen to what you have to say to help older people, um, you know, care about what you care about to help adults in your life, like be thoughtful about how they can help you because they will want to help you. Maybe not everyone, but a lot of them will. So I think when you're, when you're trying to decide, okay, we've got this grassroots organization or this grassroots kind of movement going now, how do we flip it and like really push on the advocacy um, towards like policymaking? That is really a key piece is just thinking about, okay, here's our strengths. Here's what we need. And, and, you know, most of us take some sort of government class, I think in high school or secondary um, school. So think about like what those steps look like and where you need that help. Um, and I'll, I'll say here in the U S um, in any case, your representatives, is, if you're doing it at the state level, you'll have a state representative and a state senator and you know they they will offer 15 minute meetings like you can just call their office and say hey i'm so and so i care about pollution in my neighborhood i you know i want to chat with representative smith about that and they will give you 15 minutes of their time and maybe it's virtual um but they they will listen to you and you know recently here um in washington we actually have um a youth volunteer who's worked with you know, he had this idea for a bill that he wanted to do and he worked, he brought it up to the organization that he was volunteering with. And now there's like a whole like four or five organizations that are helping him pass this bill. So like, again, be thinking about those connections, maybe that you're not thinking of them necessarily as influencing policy, but if they can't help you, there's a high likelihood that they can point you to someone who can. Absolutely. Absolutely. I think so many things that you just touched on are, are on one hand, easier said than done. Yes. But also totally. on the other hand, a lot of it is actually 
easier than it sounds. <laughs> I completely agree. Yeah. Yeah. Like I, we I, build I, it up to be this like really scary, like black box, like cloak and dagger thing. And it, it can be that way sometimes, but often we, we have a little bit more control than we think we do on this, these things. Absolutely. And I think again, to your point, like thinking outside the box, showing up authentically, like we talked about for the last question is, is huge here. But again, using your youth to your advantage, this, what I'm about to say may set you up for, um, some condescending comments from older people, uh, yeah, as, as I have, I have absolutely personally experienced, but as young people, when we approach older folks, people in positions of power, whether again, appointed or elected, they have this kind of like, not necessarily I'm older than you, so I know better than you, but you do kind of have to approach them with a level of respect. Mm -hmm. I think when you come to them, just asking questions, that is when you're going to get maybe a little bit of that condescending tone from some of them, a little pat on the head, like, oh, it's so cute. You're just asking. But first of all, there's no such thing as a stupid question. It is worth it to just ask whatever questions that you have, because the worst thing that they can do is just ignore them. They can't shut you down. They can't tell you off. They can't, if you're just simply asking a question, you're just requesting a flow of information. That's at the very fundamental level. And so, you know, leveraging your position as a young person to ask these questions is really effective because then they're like, it, it, let me rephrase that. It is very effective because as you said, finding the right people to ask these questions to is one thing, but then when you find the right questions to ask, that's also huge as well. You know, I see some things in the chat here about in, in um, South Sudan specifically, uh, in the UK, um, all of these different areas that you guys are from, which I think is so cool that we have so many different perspectives on and, and systems of government represented here as well. Um, yeah. But as far as like people in positions of power not listening and like essentially actively not caring about these issues, you can also go to the polluters themselves and ask them, why are you doing this? That is, you know, finding somebody to ask a question to. It might not be the exact right person. It might not be the exact right question, but at least you are, you know, initiating that conversation. You are flagging to them, hey, we have some concerns about this. Like, what is going on here? Um, and then you can kind of move forward. Now, this next question here, if you have advice for youth, um, advocating for environmental legislation who want to directly engage with policymakers and these decision leaders. Um, I will have this question kind of lead us into our Q&A here. Um, okay. So I will have you answer this and then we'll just uh, shoot right over to the Q&A. There's already some awesome questions in here. Um, yeah, so do you have any final advice for environmental legislation, engaging directly with policymakers? Yeah, um, I, Laura, you made some really great points that I also should have mentioned. So, um, you know, like going to the polluters themselves, that, that can be really powerful. Um, you know, corporations and businesses and um, polluters in general tend to care about their public image, right? Um, so you challenging that can often be, a, you know, a, an incentive for them to get their act together, so to speak. Um, when we're thinking about, okay, how do we advocate for environmental legislation? How do we engage directly with policymakers? I think, Laura, you hit the nail on the head where we have to come from a place of respect um, because we are working in a certain system, right? Like that's just how things are for now. And um, I think, the genuine curiosity and the genuine like passion um, often, not always, but often helps to reduce like their defensiveness. Um, and sometimes you might get a more real conversation because 
you know, they, their, their defenses are lowered. They see you're passionate about it. Um, you know, you're young, they don't want to come off sn snooty or rude, um, or they don't want to lose your future vote, whatever the case might be. So, um, when, you know, my advice, I think, is just um, look look for opportunities to do that. Again, I wish that I had more of a international um, perspective on how you can engage with your policymakers. And um, yeah, I saw like um, in a few of the chats that you know, like people aren't listening or they're not making themselves available. And again, I'll go back to find ways to make yourselves available. So for example, if you are having a difficult time getting in touch with your legislator or representative or whoever, whatever title that person holds that represents you, um, go wait outside their office. Have a protest outside their office. Tag them in a social media post and say like, hey, so-and-so with their tag is not responding to this issue that we care about in our community they're going to see those things. And that definitely is like a little more, you know, aggressive. Those, those tactics are more aggressive, but I think you have to be ready to adapt your approach based on their response. And if you're not getting what you need from them, how do, how do you get it? And are you okay being more aggressive in those ways? Or, you know, maybe you're not okay doing that kind of thing yet. You're just not comfortable. You need support. Are there other organizations that are meeting with that person? Are there other organizations that are um, that are working on a similar issue, but perhaps from a different angle? Form coalitions. Like, what is your group doing that another group is doing, or maybe an issue that they're you're both doing? Where you know it's kind of like a Venn diagram, right? Like, what's the overlap? As Laura was saying earlier. So there are definitely different ways to go about it, and I think you just need to again, be self-respect, reflective and think about what are you comfortable doing? Like maybe you're not super great at public speaking and the idea of like having a one-on-one -on -one with a legislator feels really overwhelming. Go with a friend, like, you know, go with a parent, go with a teacher, go, like pick someone who you feel confident with, or you, that helps you feel like, okay, I've got this go together. That's totally fine. Um, you know, or do a virtual meeting and have like four or five of you on screen. Um, FaceTime is really, really critical and it makes a difference. You know, think about who you all know as like environmental advocates, right? There are many that we now know as almost celebrities because they started as one person and they used their social media platforms. They used their connections, they use their parents' connections to create awareness. Um, you know, Greta Thunberg, for example, she just started by skipping school. I am not advocating that you all do that. I, maybe there's a time and a place for that, but I, I don't think that's necessarily the best approach. But we are all much more powerful and much more capable of influencing policy than we think we are. And I encourage you to take that from me because when I was your age, I felt very paralyzed by the overwhelming like choices and ideas and tactics and I just didn't ever get started because I was so overwhelmed by that and I just want to encourage all of you not to be that way especially as a generation where you have things that are much more innate to you you have a better grasp on technology you have a better grasp on like working together about things that you care about um and you know you have a lot of empathy for others and I think those are all incredible strengths that you can use to guilt trip your grandparents to listen to you, but also guilt trip your representatives to listen to you as well. Um, and if anybody a deserves a guilt trip, it's usually our elected officials. <laughs> Correct. Correct. Um, yeah, I, I super appreciate that. We are at the top of the hour here. So I want to make sure we have time for at least a couple of questions. So I apologize in advance. We are probably going to go a few minutes over. No worries. Um, but there are two questions in here that I think are pretty similar. Um, so the first one is from Karam. How can we facilitate interconnectedness across all these diverse perspectives um, and amplify marginalized voices, ensuring they're not only heard, but uplifted, especially indigenous perspectives? And then Karam asked a very similar question to that. 
um, climate action sustainability efforts can often be compartmentalized and how do we facilitate more interconnectedness between organizations, groups, and people? So Karam had these two really awesome questions and then Maisie in the Q&A also followed that up with connecting campaigns as university students, which I think is just another one of those organizations that you can kind of collaborate with. So all of this to say, you know, it's not just about uplifting these voices, but connecting with them. Again, going back to making those genuine connections with our community members that we're trying to support. Um, so yeah, I'll, I'll let you go ahead. Yeah, I will do my best to answer these as um, specifically as I can. So when we're thinking about facilitating interconnectedness, um, part of that is when we're doing our kind of research into who is affected by the the topic or the issue that we care about. So of course, climate change is a big one. Um, so I probably should have mentioned this sooner, but like we can break that down into more like snackable, digestible pieces, right? Like climate change is this big, overwhelming, you know, always looming thing, but we can break that down into, hey, yeah, factory, you're polluting, like, what are you doing? Um, and so when we're thinking about that issue, like, again, what are the other groups that are working on this already? Or are there other groups? Are there communities that are advocating for themselves? Are there, um, you know, community members who are interested, but don't really know where to start? Like, where do you kind of fit into that piece? And I think that is kind of in a way its own facilitation because you're doing the work to understand what's happening and what's out there and doing your best to incorporate um, broader perspectives into your work. Um, but also it's a great opportunity to think about forming coalitions as I was just mentioning. So um, as an example, here in Washington state, we have orca whales that are critically endangered and there are a lot of different ways that they are threats that they are being impacted by. And so one of the things that we at the Seattle Aquarium are part of is a coalition of different groups that are working on orca recovery. Now we all have different opinions. We don't agree on anything. I'll tell you that right now. But what we agree on is that we need to act now. And so as a coalition, we have written sign up or sign on letters, comment letters. Um, we've met with our legislators because we all live in a different district. Um, we have put the word out to all of our members because we, we as organizations have our own audiences. So instead of just focusing on one audience, now we have an audience made up of, you know, 18 different mem uh, organizations audiences. So I think coalition building can be really powerful in terms of facilitating that interconnectedness. Um, and also when we think about, you know, indigenous peoples and indigenous perspectives, um, oftentimes they have a tribal council or some sort of council that meets regularly that, you know, kind of helps lead those tribes or those indigenous groups um, in a particular way. And so going to them and asking what their priorities is a, are and where you can lend a hand is a great way to demonstrate that you're not just coming in and trying to make promises and, you know, what like do this work on their behalf, but that you really want to contribute your resources and your audience and your network, et cetera, to things that they're working on. And a lot of times you're going to find out that they're probably working on things that you didn't think anyone was working on or that you really care about. Um, and so I think th those are kind of like the really key pieces of trying to be in, you know, interconnected. And again, like you're going to have to um, be comfortable with being uncomfortable because these things can be really hard. We have to, as you know, activists or as advocates, we have to be aware that our work impacts the lives of other people. And sometimes that feels like life or death, especially when we're thinking about pollution, air pollution, water pollution, et cetera. Um, or we're thinking about like loss of cultural resources. Those, those are very personal things to, to communities. And we have to be really aware of our knowledge of our the space that we hold maybe that's a place of privilege maybe not but um i think the more authentically you present what you care about and the more authentically you show up um 
the interconnectedness will kind of fall together. And, you know, if you're being aware of it and if at least you're making effort, that will show up. It will show people will start, you know, saying, yeah, Karam is like really great. And, you know, they're working to, um, really hard on trying to like get us to connect and, you know, word of mouth and other things will kind of help that fall into place. Yeah, absolutely. Um, we do have one more question in the Q and A, and I'm going to yeah. get to it very quickly. Uh, Razia, I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. How to navigate a campaign in an environment full of personal and professional conflict? I think that um, we've talked Ooh. a lot about this compromise side of things already. We've talked about, um, you know, the intergenerational collaboration and and making sure that you are reaching out to voices. You know, taking a, a mental note of who isn't in the room with you, making sure that you're getting as many perspectives on an issue as possible. But again, along with that will often come different types of conflict on different scales as well. And I want to shout out something that you had mentioned earlier um, is, you know, if you ever do hit a moment where you're like, I can't do this, I, I need my personal motivations do not any longer align with the broader goals of this organization or this campaign or what have you, I think it is fully within your right as an advocate to step away for whatever reason that is. Um, But in terms of more like just navigating conflict in general, do you have any kind of closing words of advice? Yeah. So like I've said many times, it depends. (laughs) Um, Without knowing and feel free um, to like if you want to add context to drop it in the chat and I will try to um, speak to it a little bit more, but thinking just more generically when typically when we have um, conflict, it's because we're really passionate about something, right? Like maybe if you think about it, like in a corporate setting, right? Like you care about your work-life balance, but your supervisor cares about like your profit for that quarter or month or whatever. Um, So Oftentimes it's because we're passionate about something and our passions are feel like they're in conflict or they, or as I like to say, we care about the same thing. So we care about the what, but we're really passionate about the how, and that's what's in conflict. And what I mean by that is like, for example, if we, myself and another person really care about orca recovery, but I think we need to focus on pollution and the water, and someone else thinks we need to really focus on boat noise and underwater noise, we might be in conflict. We might be forgetting that we, the what, meaning orca recovery is shared by both of us. And we just disagree on how, on on what the issue is that we're going to tackle first. So I think it can be really helpful to remind yourself and remind whoever is part of that contact conflict, um, like what you're fighting for, what are you passionate about? Like, what is the overarching thing that brought you together in the first place? Um, if, and, you know, I'm thinking of from an advocacy perspective and then, you know, start there and say, like, take time to feel your frustration, your anger, your hurt, whatever, but also think about, okay, what is this other person passionate, so passionate about and why? And really try to listen to their reasoning, really try to listen, not to respond, but to fully like digest what it is that they are trying to tell you. And then think about your argument and think about, okay, are there similarities there? Why am I feeling this way? Um, Self-reflection and emotional intelligence will carry you so far. Um, And what I mean by that is being very self-aware, like what are you willing to compromise on? What are you not willing to compromise on? Are you being like, is it that you just cared about this thing because you've always wanted to do it that way, but now there might be evidence to do it a different way. Um, And that's kind of like conflict in an advocacy space. If you're thinking about like, my supervisor is not a nice person and is making me feel, you know, um, underappreciated or making me feel like you know, I'm not capable of doing my job and we're constantly, I'm constantly worried about being fired or being in trouble or things like that. But first and foremost, I just want to say, I hope that's not the case because I know how crummy that feels and it, it, it can be very soul crushing <laughs> to be in that scenario. But if that is the scenario, I think taking a step back, thinking about what your manager or supervisor, or whatever has been telling you, 
are there hints of truth in what they're saying? Like, is there something that you could be doing better that maybe they're just not communicating well? If that's not the case, that's fine too. But I think having a, a real conversation, and I will say a lot of times in these instances where someone who is an authority to us um, doesn't expect you to advocate for yourself. And when you do advocate for yourself and you do call them out, they will often say, oh my God, I didn't know I was doing that. Are there crappy bosses out there who are just going to be crappy no matter what? Absolutely. But a lot of times when we remind someone that we're feeling disrespected or undervalued or whatever, it changes how they are thinking of you. And a lot of times that's not their intention. So I think being again being reflective of what is the dynamic what what to you are the issues that you think your manager is trying to um you know describe or or um communicate to you is really helpful because you can go into a meeting with them and say you know i really wanted to chat about my performance lately i i i feel as though you think i am not you know performing in xyz way I think that I can do better by doing whatever you think you can do better. And I think it would be really helpful if we could talk about how you could communicate to me better so that I feel more confident in performing and meeting your expectations. Simple as that. It doesn't have to be adversarial. It doesn't have to be like this big thing, but just being like, again, self-aware and, and thinking through their feedback will help them know that you are trying to do what they're asking of you. And it will also show them that you are, you know, using your emotional intelligence to find ways that you can better that dynamic and that relationship so that you can meet their expectations and framing it that way really shows them that you want to do right by them. And I think that can also be really helpful. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I really appreciate that as, as tying a little bow on this conversation, because I think that that applies, you know, when you're, engaging with either your boss or your manager, but also with your elected officials as well. And, and Absolutely. other community members. Um, so thank you so much, Miguel. Again, I, I really appreciate you taking your time out of, out of your weekend to join us for this conversation. And for those of you who are still on, I know we are 15 minutes over the hour, so I do apologize, but this has been a really wonderful conversation and I'm not mad that we're over the hour at all. I think this has been super, super valuable. Um, so to kind of wrap this up, as this is the last session of this cycle of advocacy training, you are all now eligible to uh, submit a feedback survey for the certificate of completion for the program. So the responses that we receive from the feedback survey are critical for us to continue to improve this program, making sure that it stays relevant to the things that you guys care about. Again, going back to taking a survey of your community, seeing what the issues are, where they want to go. That is us, this is us sending you this feedback survey is us asking you exactly that. So what can we be doing to improve? How can we help you, um, you know, continue your advocacy journey into the future? And once you are able to submit that, if you can get it into us by uh, no later than Tuesday, the 10th of December, um, we will send you a certificate of completion for the program. Um, completed means that all of the questions have been answered in full and also just make sure that your email address is written correctly in that um, text box because if it is not, we don't have another way to uh, communicate with you and you will not receive your certificate. So just make sure um, that you check that twice. Uh, and then again, thank you everybody for you know, consistently showing up to these sessions. I always have a really great time with all of our panelists and, and get really excited every time we have a new cycle of training coming up. So keep up the good work with everything that you're doing. Um, if you need a refresher, if you want to revisit some of the conversations that we've had, um, again, all of the recordings for all of the sessions for all of our training cycles are up on the World Ocean Day YouTube channel. And then the other thing that we would love to see happen moving forward is for you to take every Everything that you've learned through advocacy training and actually put it uh, to tangible use. And the perfect way to do that, I think, I might be biased, but I think a great way to do that is to plan your own World Ocean Day event. It's a great way to have collective action, everybody doing something all together on the same day all around the world. We have tons of resources out on our website. We have a 
event planning and social media toolkit that will be going up probably sometime in the new year. We'll have different posters and different downloadable uh, uh, worksheets that you can use, um, all sorts of stuff. You can submit your event on our uh, website as well. All of that stuff is coming a little bit after the new year. We're going to take some time um, here in December. We will have a mental health webinar, a, a youth advocate mental health climate emotions webinar in early December. Um, be sure to check your email inbox for information on that. Um, but again, thank you guys all so much for um, coming together and, and attending this program. We really, really appreciate it and hope you got a lot out of it. So um, if you're interested in joining us again for our next training cycle, that will be in uh, February and March 2025. So we'll take some time off and then we'll see you soon. Uh, but again, to our wonderful speaker, Miguela, our wonderful speaker, Miguela, um, thank you so much for joining us again. And, and I really enjoyed this conversation. We really appreciate it. Yeah. Likewise, Laura, thanks so much for having me. And I did drop my contact info in the chat. I can drop it one more time. Um, or feel free to pass on my email if you get any questions, but thank you yeah. all so much for having me. This is great. Awesome. Thank you guys so much. We'll see you online soon. Bye, everyone.